And I want to welcome everyone to the webinar, Food Safety Education and Planning for Agritourism. My name is Lisa Chase. I work for University of Vermont Extension and the Vermont Tourism Data Center. And I marked the map with uh, the sparkler to show you where I am, which is over. There's a bunch of dots over in that section, but I'm in the um, Bottom right-hand corner, the southeast corner of Vermont, I'm in Brattleboro, which is right on the border of New Hampshire and Massachusetts. If you haven't already taken a moment to uh, mark the map with the sparkler tool to the left of the map, please take a moment now to do so. It's great to see that we have uh, quite a mix of people, um, folks from the Northeast as well as California, Minnesota, Illinois, and Louisiana. This is definitely a uh, one of the benefits of a, of a webinar is we can not only reach the farmers and the people we work with in Vermont, we can also reach people around the country, all while in the comfort of our offices. I'm going to um, switch slides now. As you can see on this slide, we've, I've got uh, two co-presenters. Ben Anston and Ben Anston and London Wadi K. I'll give them a bit more introduction, but first I want to mention that this webinar is part of a project that's funded by the Northeast Center for Risk Management Education. Um, I'm based out of the Brattleboro office, as I mentioned, and I work with agritourism and culinary tourism in Vermont as well as throughout the Northeast. And I've had, had the pleasure of uh, working with a number of different farms and colleagues throughout the country even um, through the Extension Network. And um, I'm fortunate to have two colleagues that I work closely with joining me today. Londa Ndwadike is a food safety specialist also with the University of Vermont Extension. She has worked all over the world and recently came to Vermont. And we are very fortunate to have her um, here in Vermont working on a variety of food safety issues with farms. Um, since she came to Vermont, she has started to work more and more with agritourism. Back when she was in Africa, the focus wasn't so much on tourism and agritourism. Now that she's in Vermont, it's you pick meals on the farm, CSAs, other types of agritourism, because you're putting farms, people, farm animals, food, a whole bunch of things all together, and there's bound to be food safety issues. Agritourism is, is growing in Vermont, and with that growth comes more concern and more issues about how to stay on top of food safety. Agritourism is also big in New Hampshire, where our colleague Ben Amston works. He's with Plymouth State University's Center for Rural Partnerships. And he actually is the principal investigator on um, the, grants that, the grant that's helping to fund this webinar, the Northeast Center for Risk Management Education. And Ben has been working for several years now um, in New Hampshire as well as Vermont and other states um, working on agritourism and culinary tourism. And Ben is going to start us off today um, giving us some background about food safety, agritourism, risk management, and how it all comes together. Well, thank you, Lisa. I'm happy to be here today. And I'm happy to talk about risk management. Do you want to go through um, the questions? The poll questions. Well, yes, I'm actually, good, good point. Thank you. Why don't we Why don't we take a moment um, before we get into Ben's presentation, since we've got quite a few people um, on the webinar. It's great to see. Why don't we take a moment to find out more about who's with us? Um, you'll notice some. Um, you'll notice A, B, C, and D below your um, the participant list thing. Please take a moment now to click on the letter A, B, C, or D, where A is a farmer, B is extension educator or outreach, C is policy or advocacy, and D is other. Please take a moment to choose A, B, C, or D. Let us know where you're from. Uh, 
I'll publish the. I'll give you uh, one more moment to figure it out, and then I'm putting up the poll results here. If I can try to, there. Ah. If I can get rid of some of the extra ones. All right. Looks like we've got. I'll do one more update here. As answers keep coming in, and it looks like we have about half extension, and then quite a few farmers, quite a few other, and a little bit of policy and advocacy. Um, feel free to write what that other is in the chat box. And also, I do want to remind everyone to, at any point during the webinar, feel free to type questions into the chat box. Now, now it's good to see who's on, who we have on the uh, webinar. Let's take a moment to learn more about the people who are farmers. For those of you, this is a question just for those of you who are farmers. We've got A is you pick, B is prepared foods on the farm or perhaps at the farmer's market, C is if you're a CSA, um, and D is other. So I'm going to, I just cleared the um, letters there. So those of you who are farmers, if you wouldn't mind taking a moment to um, let us know what kind of farm you have. You pick prepared food, CSA, or other. And can they put, oh, we have a question. Can they pick multiple answers? Ah, and another one said all of the above. Boy, <laughs> we should have put all of the above there. How about if you're all of the above, um, do other, and feel free to type into the chat box to specify. Because um, all of the because it looks like all of the all, um, all of the above or other um, may be the winning one. Yep, a lot. So lots of all of the above. Okay, um, this will help Londa and Ben and myself as we go through the webinar, um, so we can focus on what specifically is most important to you. And again, don't hesitate to type into the uh, chat box at any time. And now I'm going to turn it over to Ben. I wanted to sort of <coughs> kick off the comments today with a little bit of an overview about what risk management is generally, specifically, why people should be paying attention to risk and what some of the key issues are that we're going to look at. And this is sort of going to set up a Lisa, uh, Alanda's specific comments about food safety in particular. So. You know, I think we're talking about risk management in this context, in food safety context, because of sort of one simple rule, right, which is that if there's food, folks will come, right? That's what we're hoping for, and that's the, the big outcome of, of many uh, value-added endeavors. And when we think about risk, there are really simple and, and, and complicated definitions. You know, most simply we think of risk as just a, a chance that some sort of undesirable event will occur, right? An illness, uh, uh, somebody getting hurt, uh, you know, somebody having a bad experience. But there's also a certain complexity behind it, too, that we need to be aware of, which includes ideas of probability. You know, how likely is one risk? Uh, how is one risk more likely to happen than another one? What will the severity of certain uh, unfortunate events be? Who will be involved? And those types of things. So the point is, is that, that risk can be a fairly complicated concept when it comes to uh, agritourism and, and food safety in particular. But to sort of boil it down, though, why do we manage it? Why do we pay attention to it? Two main reasons. We want to protect customer health. And more importantly than not, uh, you know, if you have a business, you'll want to uh, do what you can do ultimately to protect it at the end of the day. So having said that, there are really three tools for risk management. And I think that they're straightforward if we stop and think about them for a minute. The first tool has to do with sort of the help and advice of experts, right? If you're an agritourist, farmer and you're thinking about uh, doing something with food or, or having visitors to your farm, you really need more than just an insurance agent sort of on your side. You know, there are lawyers, food safety professionals, financial managers, technology gurus, uh, pretty much a wide array of experts out there that can help you look at not just sort of the traditional liability that we think about in the more simple risk management co uh, context, but also the more complicated ones, right? We can set up strategies. We can think about business development. 
contracts, uh, statutory compliance, environmental compliance, essentially having experts on your side from a, uh, a wide array of places helps you think about stuff that you haven't necessarily thought out before. So that tool, you know, having a wide array of experts also transitions into the second one, I think, which is a support network. And this support network reaches a little broader, right? It, it, it reaches out to include stakeholders. And what we mean by that are essentially people who hold some kind of stake in the success of your venture. If you're thinking about agritourism, you're going to want to develop a network of relationships with these types of individuals. Now, people that have a, a, a stake in the success of any venture include members of the public, uh, local officials, elected officials, professional associations, other landowners, your neighbors in your, in your community, uh, other people that you interact with at a community level, and really networking with these different stakeholders allows someone who's thinking about risk management to sort of be strategic in a different way, right? And in this case, it really provides you an opportunity to gain access to others who have been successful in the past, right? Other people who have navigated the challenges of visitation, having visitors come onto the farm, uh, tourism marketing, you know, they can share with you the things that they've been successful with and the things that they haven't been so successful with. There are a lot of people out there who have had experiences with audits or or with uh, complaints or with investigations that really have a, um, a unique experience that you're not necessarily going to find you know, just searching the web. And so a really important tool here is to just sort of get out and talk to other people that are doing similar things uh, uh, that you're doing. And you know that tool also helps you with the first one, right? If by developing this network, getting out and talking to people, it helps you um, uh, figure out essentially who the experts are. And uh, uh, you know, people will give you advice on who to talk to in your region, or they can <laughs> give you um, a suggestion as to who's good, who's not, things like that. In terms of the third tool, the personalized risk management plan, this one is pretty important uh, because it should be sort of a written document, right? It should do something, it should be something that you've put together uh, in conjunction with the experts that you've sought out and the people that you know. And it's really there to serve two important goals. First, it is essentially your roadmap for managing risk, right? It's got all the details of the uh, of the different types of coverage you have, of all your policy needs and, and what you've done and what you've thought about, the questions you've asked and answered, all within sort of a single convenient document. And Secondly, this written plan, this personalized management plan, is also a good tool to help you evaluate success over the long term, right? You can go back to it every year or every couple of years and say, geez, what's working? What's not? Has anything in my business changed? Has something uh, come up that I didn't anticipate before? So having this kind of personalized risk management plan in a written format, in a file somewhere, is in a place that you can pull it out and evaluate it is uh, a really important tool. And uh, at the end of this webinar, there'll be a link to um, uh, some resources, and on that resource page you'll find a template for putting together a personalized risk management plan. So having said that, we've got these three tools, right, advice from experts, networking with stakeholders, and creating a personalized plan. That helps us address some of the bigger questions of, of risk management in agritourism. But it's important to remember at the same time that there isn't really a, a one-size-fits-all one plan for managing risk. Everybody has sort of unique circumstances, right, that you have to consider when you're developing your approach to risk management, specifically in food safety, too. And there are a number of questions that I just wanted to go over quickly to get you thinking about, okay, how might my business be different than, than somebody else's, or what do I need to do specifically? First question, you know, why isn't liability insurance enough? You know, that's one that we get quite frequently. And, you know, we think about traditional liability, right, the traditional comprehensive coverage that, that most of us who run businesses have, and they sort of cover the regular operation, right? Standard production, medical payments if somebody has an accident or, or if somebody's working. And it, it sort of assumes that you're doing business in a traditional sense. So if you're on a farm, most of those policies assume that you're going to be, you know, doing farming, right? But what they don't necessarily cover are sort of the, the non-value added things, right? The the uh, or I mean the value excuse me, the value added things, the things that may not be part of your regular day to day business as traditionally defined. And so these live policies don't often anticipate that you're hosting visitors. They don't necessarily figure then that people are going to be coming on to your farm and that you're going to
going to be generating profit from that. So it's important, again, to make sure that you have a pretty good sense of what you want to do and, and make sure that you're, you're covered for it. So then that leads to the question of what kind of insurance is out there. Well, there's a lot of different kinds, um, and many of, it, uh, many of them are, are the types of insurance that we're not necessarily familiar with. Product liability insurance, which uh, covers injuries that comes out that may uh, arise from a product if it's grown or made or sold. Uh, premises liability insurance, which uh, uh, protects you if you if somehow um, the public or, or some member of the visiting public uh, injures themselves. Uh, employers liability insurance, physical damage insurance, all these different types of insurance that are out there again highlight the importance of ha highlight the importance of having some kind of personalized plan, right? Having something written down where you can keep it all straight because it is um, is fairly complicated. Working with others, uh, in some cases, you need to uh, uh, ensure that people that you're working with have their own liability insurance, and, uh, specifically contractors. If you're having caterers come on board or, or other third par parties that provide services for you, you want to make sure that they've arranged for their own insurance. Um, how do you ensure that everyone is following uh, uh, best practices? That's uh, things like this, you know, looking at the different kinds of tools that are out there, uh, talking to people that are doing similar things as you, um, uh, looking at the particular things that you're doing, for example, overnight stays, if you've got an additional, uh, consider if you've got additional considerations for overnight visitors like smoke detectors, carbon monoxide detectors, is your property ADA compliant if you're having people come into your house, if you have family pets, right, are they, are they social? and friendly. And uh, so really that leads us to the final question that you have to ask yourself, which is if somebody has a bad experience, you know, what are you going to do? And we, we tend to think of that in terms of that, uh, that old saying about how if a customer has a bad experience, they're going to tell 10 people. If they have a good experience, they'll tell many fewer people, two or three. So are you prepared for negative publicity, especially through new means such as social media that may be uh, much harder to deal with? Are you familiar with what might happen if um, an investigation does occur? And you know, we say these things not to strike fear into the hearts of, uh, of folks that are thinking about or doing agritourism, but more just to kind of ask the question, you know, what, what's on your um, uh, radar screen for being prepared for a bad experience? <clears throat> so with that, there were uh, some other things to think about in terms of getting started, some key questions, you know, to ask yourself, do you host alcohol or do you have any activities that uh, involve food? Uh, you know, are you prepared to train uh, employees to follow those best practices? Can you be sure that everyone does it? And, you know, finally, <coughs> having a, um, uh, a particular plan in place. So having said that, uh, th I think that gives us sort of an overview of, uh, of risk management generally. And now might be a good time to transition into a discussion of food safety in particular and how that fits into the uh, risk management contact that, uh, context that I just described. So with that, I think we're going to turn it over to Londa now, who will walk us through uh, uh, some food safety. All right. Thank you very much, Ben. Hopefully everybody can hear me OK. Um, unfortunately, my microphone seems to have chosen today to act up. So, so hopefully uh, I don't cut out. But if I do, just let me know. Um, and it's great to see such a, a wide variety of people um, on this webinar today. And, and um, you know, because there is such a wide variety of people that are going to be on it, I'll just be talking g generally general food safety practices um, because I, obviously I can't go into specifics about any one type of operation since, um, since all of you are involved in different operations. But um, at the end, um, we'll be listing some resources um, that are available. And, and we're also working on some other fact sheets specifically about uh, you know, different aspects of food safety and agritourism that um, will be made available um, in the future when they're ready. So. Um, so I'll, I'm just going to talk generally about food contamination and how it happens, what's the impact of foodborne illness, and Ben has already brought that up, I think, very well. Uh, you know, who needs to be concerned? And I'll talk a little bit about risk-based food safety um, systems as well. So first of all, and I, I think, you know, and I realize that a lot of you probably already know, generally speaking, about um, food contamination, but, but I just wanted to 
just bring up the three different types of food contamination that we think about a lot is, is microbial contamination, which is your bacteria, you know, salmonella, E. coli, listeria, people hear a lot about those. Um, and those are, that's an obviously very important um, type of, of food contamination. But there's also other types of food contamination that we worry about, um, which is chemical contamination, having, um, you know, pesticides or having even um, cleaners that are, that were used improperly. Um, also, um, allergens is another one I didn't have listed, but allergens is a big issue these days um, with more and more people being allergic or sensitive to, um, sensitive to allergens these days. Another um, type of food contamination that's important to think about is, is physical contamination. Um, if you're having, um, you know, prepared food on the farm, you don't want to have any little stones or, or pieces of wood in the, in the food. You don't want to have glass, obviously, um, in the food either. So you have to be thinking about all these different types of contamination. Um, for example, maple, maple syrup is a big thing in Vermont. And, um, a lot of people feel like, ah, with you know, maple syrup, there's no food safety concerns because you cook it to 190 degrees, so you're cooking all the, all the bacteria away. But we still have to be concerned about, about chemical contamination. So, um, so just to draw attention that they're all important. So how are contaminants getting into, into our agritourism operations or our food processing operation, whatever it is? Um, the thing is, Microorganisms are everywhere. Microorganisms are in the, they're present in the intestine of healthy animals. Um, you know, so even if you have a very healthy, um, you know, animal, a steer or a chicken or whatever it is, um, it, it has microorganisms in the, in the intestine. And, and so when they're slaughtered, they can get, can, the carcass can become contaminated. Produce as well, um, you know, it can be washed with contaminated water or irrigated with contaminated water. Of course, produce is generally speaking grown in fields. Birds are there. Um, deer can be there. So, so contaminants have a way of getting in. Um, in processed foods, if you're doing um, some sort of a value-added type of food product, we think a lot about cross-contamination of, um, you know, another product contaminating the product that you're working on, or if the humans that are working with the, um, with the product, you know, have, have some sort of sickness that can also get onto the, into the product. So I, I think many of us probably know, generally speaking, the symptoms of foodborne illness. The main ones that we think about are um, ones that are gastrointestinal, the nausea and vomiting and cramps and so on. Um, but, but there's also some other symptoms that can come as well that are even more severe. And of course, uh, many of you have been hearing about uh, the listeria and cantaloupe outbreak uh, that happened in this past fall. And you know, I, think, I think it's 29 deaths, or I, I can't remember the exact number right off the top of my head. But, but there's definitely, um, it's definitely something we need to be concerned about. Um, so I gave some examples down here, Listeria and cantaloupe, E. coli and sprouts. Um, you know, there's been E. coli outbreaks in, in strawberries and spinach, salmonella and peanut butter. So there's been outbreaks in, in things that we don't always expect um, to have foodborne outbreaks in. So this is important for agritourism providers to be thinking about, that it's not only meat products or something that we need to think about. We need to think about a variety of different products as potentially um, hazardous. So um, as Ben talked about as well, the impact of foodborne disease um, is, can be huge. You know, it's really hard to, to fully determine what the impact of foodborne illness is. Um, but as I starred down here, one of the really important ones, I think, um, for agritourism providers is, you know, like Ben said, if one person has a bad experience on your farm or if one person, you know, has a bad experience from something that you, um, that you provided, that unfortunately is going to probably, that can cause a lot of problems. So, um, so, you know, you really just want to try to prevent any problems from, from happening on your farm. I know a lot of times, um, 
you know, farmers and processors and so on that I work with, they often think that, you know, food safety regulations and so on are just really cumbersome and they're they're annoying and so on, but but actually it's really can help you to protect your business as well if you have good food safety procedures in place. Um, another reason why it's really hard for us to to know what is the impact of foodborne disease is because they're so um, that it's so underreported. We really have a hard time knowing exactly how many foodborne illnesses do take place or do occur in the U.S. And it's very hard often to to determine the exact source of the disease. Um, and this is another important point for agritourism providers to think about. Um, you know, if if somebody has been on your farm or if somebody has been, um, you know, has picked apples at your farm or whatever it is, and they go back home and and they get sick, they you know they might right away think about, oh, I was on a farm, maybe that's what made me get sick, when it might not even be related to that they were on your farm that they got sick. It could have been something else, but. Um, you know, they might associate it with, with that, the, the fact that they were on your farm. So it's very difficult to trace um, the cause of, of the disease, but, but it's just important for agritourism providers to be aware of that, that that could, that could happen. So how much foodborne illness does occur? Um, in the U.S., we often we often cite these um, statistics from CDC. Um, you know, there's 48 million illnesses every year, and, and again, like I said, it's very underreported. So we know that there's probably a lot more uh, foodborne illness occurring than is actually reported. Um, but the big thing that we really should be concerned about is um, is the is the vulnerable populations, is the young, the old, the pregnant, and the sick. Um, I myself am, am pregnant right now, and I'm uh, about eight months eight months pregnant right now, and so I'm very aware of of uh, you know the fact that I have to be so careful about listeria and, and very careful about you know any sort of other foodborne illness. And I think that you know when you're a, a farmer or food processor, agritourism provider, that you know if you're bringing in kids to your farm, which is very common, that they just have weakened immune systems, and if you have um, you know, pregnant women coming on the farm, or if there's you know elderly people coming, um, these people just have weakened immune systems, and you really have to be um, have to be very aware that uh, foodborne illness can really can hit them very hard. So, who should be concerned about about food safety? And, and as I I think I mentioned earlier, or I probably haven't mentioned yet, but you know, there's there's always, especially here in Vermont, you know, there's not always um, regulations for all these different people. And, you know, a lot of times, uh, you know, farmers can be doing a lot of these things and, and they're not regulated at all. So maybe they think, well, I don't have to worry about food safety. It's not, you know, I'm not getting regulated for it, so I don't need to think about it. But, but actually, you know, whether you're being regulated or not by the government, it's very important, you know, to protect your business that you do um, think about foodborne illness and think about food safety practices. So, you know, excuse me, I just made a list here of, of you know, the different people that should be thinking about um, food safety. Um, here in Vermont, a really growing area is um, on-farm meals. Uh, people having, you know, meals on the farm in the summer and so on, which are great things. I mean, I think it's a wonderful way for, for um, you know, the customers to be able to come onto the farm and interact with the, um, interact with the farmers and so on. But, but it's definitely an area that needs that people need to be especially aware of. Um, of course, restaurants, you pick operations. Um, it's also very important, and especially if you're also trying to um, to sell produce, um, you know, um, picked produce in bulk as well. In addition to your you pick operation, there's a lot of um, things that you need to be thinking about there. Um, CSAs, of course, you know, your reputation is based on on you know your your uh, relationship with your customers, so it's very important that you have a high level of trust with your customers, that they feel uh, like your products are very safe. Um, of course, farmers market vendors, uh, that's another area of importance. Uh, other agritourism operators, 
uh, food processors, transporters, consumers. So, you know, everyone should be concerned about food safety, of course. Um, so I just wanted to talk a little bit more about, about risk-based food safety. And, and Ben already brought this up as well and, and talked about um, a little bit about the definitions of risk. And, and um, this is an area that you know, I, I think in terms of food safety that we're really moving more towards, and even the regulations are moving more towards um, trying to look at you know, which products are the riskiest or which processes are the riskiest, and, and how can we reduce those risks. And um, so some examples of, of systems that you might have heard of, um, HACCP, which is hazard analysis and critical control points, that's required for, for meat processors to have, but it's also required for more and more, um, yeah, like uh, more and more buyers now are requiring you to have some sort of a HACCP plan in place. And, and the idea of, of HACCP is that you're trying to prevent um, foodborne problems from, from occurring or food safety problems from occurring. You're looking at where are the places in my process that, are, that present the biggest risk and how can I reduce the risk um, at, those, at those points in the process. Rather than just testing the product at the end, you're trying to look proactively and prevent um, on a risk basis, you know, your, the risks that, that could occur. Um, GAPS, of course, is another example of that, and that's good agricultural practices, and that's in um, fresh produce. And that's another, another system that, you know, they're trying to look at where are the biggest risks and, and how can we reduce um, those risks to reduce um, the food safety problems that could occur. So these sort of um, these sort of systems, they really, you know, they're designed to help decrease foodborne illness. And sorry, FBI, I, I didn't mention before, that's foodborne illness. And again, um, risk-based systems, as as Ben talked about, um, they can really be a great management tool. They can really help you to think about all the risks that are present in your operation and how can I manage these risks and how am I going to be prepared um, to, deal with, to deal with these risks. And um, it's also, as I mentioned before, you know, you might have a case where somebody, you know, was on your farm and says, ah, I got sick, I was on their farm, it must be their farm. You know, if you can present, if you can present your risk management plan or your food safety plan, you know, whatever it is, and you can say, you know, these are the things that I've done. Um, you know, it, it gives you some level of assurance that you've done all that you can to try to help um, your product to be as safe as possible and to try to reduce the possibility of, of your customers um, from getting sick. Another thing that I like to talk about, too, with producers and processors is that, um, you know, you really just want to have your customers to feel um, to feel trust in you. Obviously, that's kind of the whole idea of agritourism is real um, close interaction with between the process between the farmer and the customer. And um, so, so if you can really provide that level of trust and that that level of um, that the the customer really feels like these people are doing all that they can to make sure that my product is safe, that really helps to strengthen that relationship and that will help to strengthen, you know, their coming to your farm and hopefully telling other people what a great farm it is and what a great experience they had. So this is one of my last slides here. Just generally speaking, um, you know, what, what things can you do to, to improve food safety? And, and as I said, I, I can't go into all the details today of every different type of operation, but but generally speaking, you just want to make sure that your premises, you know, your farm, um, the equipment that you use, whatever it is, um, you know, and whatever you're using for transport, that's another important thing to think about, especially Am I back? Can you hear me? Okay, You're back good. now, Anna. Thank you. Sorry. Yes, I should have done a better risk management um, before this session and made sure that my <laughs> my microphone worked properly. Um, the good news is you're not good. chipmunked. 
<laughs> so at least when I am, when you can hear me, I sound okay. <laughs> okay. Um, so you want to like if in transport, um, if you're going to be transporting, you know, vegetables or fruits or whatever from the from the field to your farm, or whether you're, you know, if you're um, transporting products to the farmers market or whatever it is, you want to make sure that that you know that's as sanitary as possible. And um, your employees, it's very important too that, um, and I think Ben talked about before, if um, you know, your employees need to be well trained uh, as well, and they need to be trained on, you know, how to do things safely and, and so on. Um, so you just want to make sure that all these different things do not, you know, contribute to or become food safety hazards. Um, so how can we do this? How can we, you know, what what are the things that you need to have in place then to make sure that you're not going to be contributing to these food safety hazards? Um, you know, have to have a very good sanitation program in place. Um, so you know whether whether you're having a if you're doing prepared meals on the farm, you know you just have to make sure that you're really sanitizing and cleaning everything properly. Um, that you're just very aware of of um, cleaning of of whatever the equipment is that you're using. Um, pest control. Uh, you know nobody wants to see. Well, most people I don't think maybe some little kids, but nobody really wants to see a mouse running around. A farm or something, you know, you don't want to see that because that's that's a, um, you know, or at least you don't want to have the mouse running near your near the food area. Um, so because those pests, they can they can really carry um, carry disease and, and so on. So and insects as well. Um, again, you have to have very good personal practices and good hygienic practices. Um, you know, if if appropriate, you should be wearing gloves. Um, you know, hand washing is is a huge thing. Hand washing will definitely um, take care of a lot of a lot of issues if you can just if you and all your employees can really wash their hands properly, and as well as as your um, your visitors, you know, really to encourage them, especially if you have a um, a petting zoo, you know, to really make sure that you have good hand washing stations um, near the petting zoo and really Try to design your operation, in fact, so that the people have to wash their hands after they leave the petting zoo before they're eating. Um, you know, that's that's another good way to make sure that you reduce the risk of, of foodborne illness. Um, wearing hygienic clothing, of course, is is also important. Clean clean clothes. Um, another, the last thing I want to mention is is just having good hygienic practices, good manufacturing practices. Um, so just having you know having those practices in place and and just um, you know you can like like we said before you can kind of use it as a management tool of um, teaching your employees how to do things in a hygienic manner and and do things in a in a you know a, a good manner. I see some questions coming up. Yeah, actually, I wanted to uh, check in and um, find out if you want to deal with some questions now, Londa, or um, finish up and then. Um, handle some questions. Yeah, I think I, I just have two more slides, so I think I'll do that, and then I'll go to the questions if that's okay. Okay, um, no problem, and I'll I'll keep track of them as they scroll down. So the questions can con continue to come in, and I'll keep track of them, and we'll make sure we get to all of them. Okay, sounds good. Thank you. Um, so I just wanted to mention um, and some upcoming food safety events that I'm personally involved in, and um, so for those of you that are not um, Nearby in Vermont. Uh, sorry about that, but but uh, just just to kind of uh, make a, a notice for those that are in the Vermont area, um, NOFA, the Northeast Organic Farming Association in Vermont, has a direct marketing conference every year that deals with you know farmers markets and all other sorts of direct marketing. And I'll be talking at that this year about um, food safety practices for. Um, for direct marketing, um, you can see the date listed there. Um, I'm also going to be well. Actually, I won't be presenting because uh, um, I hopefully will have, be having a baby about then. But um, I'll be providing information for our Maple uh, Food Safety Conferences that are happening in January. Um, or sorry, the Maple it's Maple Conferences, but I'll be providing some food safety information. In January, um, in Vermont, we're having a food safety summit in on March 22, which is going to be pulling all the 
uh, stakeholders in food safety together, and and um, so we're going to make sure we invite you know agritourism providers and agritourism people as well as all other aspects of the food system um, to come and, and discuss that. Um, also, we'll be having some more um, food, other food safety and so on training courses. So the website is listed down there where the events are. Um, some publications that will be, uh, that could be helpful, um, and, and again, a lot of these are geared towards Vermont regulations, but um, some of them hopefully will be useful as well to other states because, um, for example, so the Farmer's Market Vendor Series um, that's available on the, this food safety website, it's on the same link as listed here. Um, the, this Farmer's Market Vendor Series, I have a, a lot of just recommendations of good food safety practices um, as well as the requirements in Vermont. So um, they're uh, so the, the different series are listed here. Um, so I also have another fact sheet on food safety requirements for Vermont food processors. Um, and then also dealing with meats as well and food distributors. Food safety after a flood, unfortunately that's something that we had to deal with a lot in Vermont. Um, all right, Lisa, would you like me to answer the questions now? Uh, actually, let me take just a moment um, to mention some resources in case this is give me one of those questions, which is, wait, what was that event, and how do I get that fact sheet that you mentioned? So here's a, a couple websites. Um, one, the, the top one, and I will send, if you put your email address into the chat box, then I will send an email out after the webinar. And I'll BCC everyone, so you know I'll protect your confidentiality. You can put your email into the chat box and send it just to the moderator, so not everyone has it. Um, if you're concerned about confidentiality, and in that email, I will send out these links as well as contact information um, for Londa, for Ben, and for me. This top link here um, takes you to an agritourism page. Um, and down at the bottom is a link specifically to food safety for agritourism. So all of those fact sheets that Londa has mentioned, um, plus some more, there's this terrific um, agritourism and food safety primer that's from California. Um, there's resources from other states as well, um, but a lot of great ones from UVM Extension. And Londa, in fact, is working on one specifically for agritourism. And all of that is gonna is on this this website here, um, and and actually this recorded webinar will be on the website pretty soon within a day or two, as well as a, um, a TV segment um, on across the fence that where um, a U pick operation was visited by by a TV crew and uh, food safety issues and precautions were talked about there. So that's that top website. Um, the next website, um, uvm.edu Extension Food, that has you know all sorts of food-related links, including general food safety information. So if, if agritourism is part of what you do, but you also do a lot of other stuff as well, and you're interested in more general food safety information, um, that's a great place to go. And that's and Londa maintains that website. And here I've got. If, if, you're not, if you're not a huge fan of um, websites um, and you actually just want to call someone up, I've got Londa's phone number here as well as her email address. And in the, in the um, email that I send out, you'll also get Ben and my address. We're now going to um, turn to a couple questions. And we've got a couple questions in there. But I also want to encourage um, all of you online, I know a lot of you are with Extension, um, and you may have developed your own resources that you want to share. So feel free to um, share your, not, you're welcome to put questions into the chat box, and as things scroll down, I'll keep track of things. But make sure that you also put in any resources um, and tips that you want to share, as well as you know, concerns and experiences, even if it's not a question per se. I want to point out there's a, um, in the chat box right now, you, you can see a link to 
SurveyMonkey.com. Um, that is an evaluation. And um, if you wouldn't mind, before you leave this webinar, if you could please um, get on that link and fill out the evaluation, that would be very helpful. Okay. And now I'm going to the rec back to the questions um, to Londa. So I'm scrolling up here looking for um, some of the questions. And one of them is, so how long can you keep your visitors from care? So how can you keep your visitors for, from carrying an illness to your farm? Um, and that's a question for you, Londa. Yes, this is a very good question, and <laughs> unfortunately, there's really no easy answer. I don't have any any um, unfortunately no magic answer for that one. Um, I think an important thing is is um, like when I talked about hand washing and so on, you know, just to really encourage your um, you know, encourage the people at your farm, your your visitors, to also be washing their hands. Um, you know, and to really provide good hand washing facilities um, all over. Like, if you're, uh, you know, just to make sure that there are, of course, bathroom facilities available, and then and then good hand washing facilities nearby that you can. Um, that you know you can really encourage them to wash their hands and, and maybe have some cute signs or something over the over the hand washing facilities of um, I can't think of something off the top of my head but you know just some something cute so that they can say oh okay it's important to wash my hands and another point too um, like I've seen at some farms is is that you know they really encourage people to wash their hands before um, they touch the animals you know to protect the health of the animals. And uh, if you have a petting zoo or something on that order, and so I think people appreciate, you know, customers to your farm appreciate that that they want to help protect the the health of the animals, so they can understand that okay, it's important to wash my hands. Um, so yes, unfortunately, I I think the best thing is the best measure is probably just to really encourage hand washing and make it available. Um, I see some more questions coming up down here. So the next question here, actually, um, one one that was um, given earlier, Londa. So if you got to scroll up for that one. Is part of the gap audit includes a visitor sign-in sheet. How do you suggest farmers and agritourism deal with a visitor sign-in sheet when they have large gr groups visiting all day? Yeah, another good question. And um, I see Wes Klein is on this on this. Uh, um, on the webinar, and I think Wes Klein from Rutgers would probably have a lot more, um, lot more experience with that than I do because he works more directly with produce. But, um, but I would say, generally speaking, I know one thing that people have um, recommended is, you know, if it is going to be a like a, a school group or something like that, that you know, the school could provide you with the list of the of the visitors before they come, so you don't have to wait for every child or whatever to sign up um, you know at your farm um, so or if it's a tour group or whatever you know if they can provide you with the list ahead of time rather than you know doing it one by one um, while they're there at your farm that would that would help Wes feel free to um, type into the chat box if you have additional suggestions uh, another question we have ha we have um, if a farm holds large special events that only happen a few times a year, such as a harvest festival, um, they may also want to look at special event insurance. Do you want to comment on that? That's probably Ben more than myself. Ben, do you have any comments on that? Yeah, I think uh, that's actually a really good idea. And many of the insurance providers that we worked with on this program did talk about uh, in insurance for special events, you know, one-off sort of policies. I think the important thing to note there is that uh, uh, it's good to get those folks involved during the planning of the event and not just, you know, two weeks before or a month before and say, oh, here's what I'm trying to do. You know, a lot of times things will pop up or they'll have ideas or input that may actually influence what you're trying to do. So I guess the point is it's a good idea to include um, your insurance agent, even if it is a one-off event, uh, to get them involved uh, as early as possible, even hopefully while you're still in the planning stage. 
That, yeah, that suggestion came from Michelle Walk, who had another good suggestion, um, which is that ServeSafe is an inexpensive certification in most states that is a good tool to help understand basic food safety standards and how to prevent foodborne illnesses. Yeah, and I'll comment on ServeSafe. Yeah, I agree. It's a great, um, a great training course that's available. It's usually about a day. and. Um, I think in Vermont it's about $170. I, I could be I could be off on that, but um, but yeah, it provide, and of course ServeSafe is geared more towards restaurant operators, but but it definitely provides a lot of great information on um, on food safety and and um, you know for those of you that are in states that have um, extension food safety people. Um, you know, they also I, I see Diane Hirsch is on the on the webinar too, and she's another extension food safety person um, in Connecticut. So, you know, for those of you that are in states that have um, extension food safety people, they can probably provide some, you know, sort of they probably pr are providing some sort of tailored training as well. But yep, serve safe is another great option also. Another question, this is from Matt, is what do you think the refrigerated life of hummus would be? No preservatives, fresh garlic, fresh lemon, extra virgin olive oil, fresh parsley, basil, basil and chives, along with some salt and pepper. Any comments on that, Londa? I think she's having a technical issue. All right. Well, hopefully, Londa will join us um, back in the back um, by talking soon. In the meantime, maybe she'll have to join us by chat. Um, we have a comment from Annalisa that you can get a copy of the Food Safety Employee Training CD in English and other languages from the Cornell University National GAPS program to show your farm employees. Um, and that sounds great. I know Cornell does a lot of um, GAPS training, um, so. And I'm thinking we, I'm thinking um, right now we might not have links to that um, on our website. So, um, Annalisa, if you want to, you know, send a link or send additional information, I imagine people can contact um, Cornell Cooperative Extension or feel free to send us a link, and we'll make sure we put it on our web page. Londa, you able to join us again? All right, I'll continue on with some um, very helpful comments. Um, Wesley Klein commented that you do not need to have a sign-up sheet. Ah, signage is the key. When you write your food safety plan, explain that you are using signage, but do not requ require sign-in sheets. So this is actually um, looking back at a, a comment much earlier. Um, Hello, can, can you hear me? Yes, you're back. You're back. OK, so let me just finish this, and then we'll go to some questions for you. Audrey had commented that part of the GAP um, audit includes a visitor sign-in sheet. Um, and Wes, is act Wes Klein is actually clarifying that um, you don't need a sign-in sheet. Um, you, you know, it, when you write your food safety plan, explain that you are using signage, but do not require um, sign-in sheets. So if you have further questions on that, um, feel free to get in touch with us, and we can steer you to um, to Wesley Klein or someone in your state who will be able to help with the um, the gaps regulations. You want to go back to okay. some questions, Londa? Yes, I'm back, Jesse. I'm, I'm using Jesse's computer now. <laughs> Sorry about that. Okay, um, and Matt, I'll 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 talk to you offline on that one. Let's. Um, since that's kind of a specific question, we'll definitely talk about it. OK, and another question is if there's any food testing programs in the Albany, New York area or Capital District that you know of or that others know of and want to type into the chat box about. Yeah, um, I don't know about Albany, New York specifically, but the um, Cornell has a great uh, food venture center, which is it's based in Geneva, uh, New York, and they provide a lot of they provide they do pH testing, they do water activity testing, 
uh, for people in New York um, and at a very low cost, $22 a sample or maybe a little less even for New York um, producers and processors. So um, that they're a great resource um, for people in New York State at least. And by food testing, I assume you mean like um, laboratory type testing. Ben, we're getting um, towards the end of our time. We can, um, I can reiterate a couple more comments here. But Ben, would you mind typing in um, the evaluation form sure, link again? Sure, I'll do it right now. Because uh, lots of questions have come in. Okay, thank you. Um, so uh, this is getting back to the um, comment on liability insurance. And um, Stu Nunnery, who is with the uh, Rhode Island um, Center and um, New England Farmways. He deals with agritourism issues throughout New England, especially southern New England. And his comment is that general liability is a, is a very limited insurance, and more and more special event insurance um, is becoming a mess. Is becoming a must. <laughs> Maybe <laughs> is becoming a must. Um, and um, feel free to get in touch with. Um, Stu, if you're in Rhode Island or Massachusetts, southern New England area, and you want more information on that. I see we've got a link from Annalisa um, on the video. And wow, you can get it in Hmong and Spanish. And um, we will make sure that we add that to our website. And I'll send that website link out to everyone. Londa and Ben, we've really just got another minute. Any um, final comments? Well, Lisa, I want to. Thank you for organizing this and being a, a great MC. I just want to uh, reiterate to everyone sort of the overall emphasis on planning and uh, documentation. You know, I talked earlier about uh, whatever is specific to your business and whatever special case you may have or, or whatever you're trying to do, just keep track of everything. And a personalized plan is the, one of the best ways to do that. So as you're finding out answers to questions or even developing questions, just think about ways either formal or even informal to keep track of all that stuff. And that's one of the uh, uh, simple yet overlooked keys to risk management, I think. All right, thank you, Ben. Londa, you all set? Yeah, I just wanted to thank um, those of you that have that have put in the different resources, and thanks, uh, Wes Klein, for your information on the signage. I I um, hadn't heard that specifically, so that's great information. So thanks to all of you for all the information you provided and, and as has been said, you know, there's a lot of great resources out there um, in this area. So, you know, just tap into, um, hopefully you can tap into someone in extension and, and they can help link you with the right people that have the information. And yeah, if you have questions, please, please feel free to ask us and we can get them directed to the right place. Okay. Well, one issue we want to take care of right before we signed off, uh, Ben? Um, how survey monkey? Um, <laughs> yes, it's coming up. To all Is that of a okay? It's, it's not okay. I wonder what happened because I had the thing all set up um, through my account and I gave it that special name of agritourism. And I wonder if there was another one that's either come online in a few minutes or existed and SurveyMonkey didn't know how to handle it. So perhaps what we'll do is I will investigate that and then maybe Lisa will send all the participants a, uh, a link to the new to the new evaluation. And um, if you could take a couple minutes later on to fill it out, it would really help all of us out. Again, I apologize for that. It seemed to work. Um, I was just double checking it during Londa's talk to make sure everything was, was on board and it was working then. So not sure why it uh, fell apart just now. All right. Well, I, we'll, we'll make sure. If, if you put your email address into the chat box, I've got it. If you haven't yet put your email address in, um, please do so now. And I will make sure you get a link to these resources, um, as well as our contact info for follow-up, and also to you know we've got a pretty good we've got a good group of farmers as well as a um, good network of extension specialists here as well. So this way we can uh, keep this conversation going because food safety is one of those issues that is uh, we're just going to hear more and more about. So it's it's in all of our benefit to. Uh, get on top of it right now and to stay on top of it. Uh, so thank you, Ben and Londa. Thank you, Jesse, for the technical assistance. And uh, most of all, thanks to all of you from all over the country um, and from Vermont for participating in the webinar.